I'm pleased to have as our guest Mr. Galen Windsor from Richland, Washington. I first heard of Galen from a tape that somebody gave to me some months ago, and I found his story to be absolutely fascinating. His story is unique, to say the least. Galen has been in 77 different cities in the last two years lecturing on the subject of nuclear energy. The majority of his life, the last 35 years, he spent processing plutonium from nuclear reactor sites. He has worked in the Manhattan Project facilities in Hanford, Washington, Oak Ridge National Laboratories and Nuclear Plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, General Electric's Midwest Fuel Recovery Plant in Morris, Illinois, General Electric's Fuel Fabrication Facility in San Jose, California, and Wilmington, North Carolina. And he's worked in every major reactor decommissioning project around this nation up to this present time. His major work in these projects has been the analytical process inventory control, which means that he was responsible for measuring and controlling the nuclear fuel inventory for these projects. Galen Windsor has few peers in the world in this area of expertise. And those few peers admittedly know and agree with the things that you'll be hearing on this tape. However, except for two or three of these experts, they've all chosen to remain silent for reasons that which they only know, leaving this man then the burden of leading this lonely battle of exposing what we call the nuclear scare scam. He's without question one of the world's foremost authorities in nuclear radiation measurement. And he's recognized by members of the Atomic Energy Commissions of all the major nations of the free world. Mr. Galen Windsor. Thank you, Ben. We've been considering today how best to approach this subject so that you would feel comfortable with where I am. And we thought it might be appropriate to start with how I got involved in this game. Now, in 1945, I was a Navy radioman out in the Pacific on a destroyer aimed for Japan. We had a one-way ticket. That's all you get, just one way. So as we uh, were becoming proficient at our business of fighting war, the Manhattan Project caught up with us and did a job. Now, the weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan in August 6, 1945 was a U-235, fully enriched U-235 weapon where the material was separated and purified in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The one that was dropped August 9th on Nagasaki was a plutonium weapon made at Hanford. But to those of us out in the Pacific, it was quite interesting. It had a ticket on it that says, you get to go home. I was impressed. Now, I was stuck out on Guam after the hostilities quit and was running a radio broadcast that communicated with 4,500 ships west of Pearl Harbor. Quite a few to listen to every dot and dash that I made. So I, I was used to having people listen to me. They couldn't see me, because they could sure hear me. I had all of the good messages that were to come to them. Fleet movements to Red Cross messages. They came along one day and says, we'd like to have radiomen to go down to Anahuitoc for the atomic bomb tests. Not me. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I want to go home. So they went through and they took every third radioman to go to Anahuitoc. I didn't go. They let me come home. But I wanted to go home. I had a driving need within me that says, hey, that big firecracker, I want to know how it works. I want to know everything about how it works. 
So back to the ranch in Nevada where I grew up and stacked hay all summer, gained back the 40 pounds that I'd lost out there in the islands. Into Brigham Young University in the fall of 46 in chemistry classes. And Dr. Joseph Nichols could make an old farm kid like me love chemistry. I hadn't had any chemistry in high school, but the way Joe Nichols taught it, I wanted to know. So chemistry it was, and some neat guys like Carl Eyring taught me physics. And long in 47, I ran across a cute blonde from Richland, Washington. Now this girl had been telephone operator for General Leslie Groves and Dr. Enrico Fermi on the Manhattan Project. She got to put through the calls to Franklin Delano Roosevelt for these guys. So she talked personally to FDR. And she told me some of the stories like you've never heard. She says, oh, in those canyons, great things are done. This cowboy from Nevada couldn't even imagine what she was talking about. Well, in 1947, after we were married, let's see, I ran until she caught me. I wasn't going to get married anyway. I wanted to get my education. I had to get on with this thing. And so we went to Richland, Washington for the first time in September of 1947. I saw that those buildings she was talking about were there, 1,000 feet long, 11 stories high, five of them below ground, uh, tremendous things. And people all over. Camp Hanford in those days was a whole army camp just there to secure that place, to provide security. Thousands of soldiers. You move around out in the desert and up out of a foxhole and pop a soldier with a gun in his hand. There wasn't any horsing around. It was all business. Back to school. In 1950, I applied for a job up there before I'd graduated. And they were so, in such bad need of chemist, I had a job before I had my degree. And so the last year of my chemistry, mostly English, I did on a bus riding 25 miles to work in the morning and 25 miles back at night. And I did advanced grammar and business writing and all of those things on that bus. But in September 1950, I got into this thing called plutonium processing when we did it barehanded, without instruments, without coveralls. We had some of the most peculiar acid burns in some of the shirts. And I found one of those the other day. It's got acid burns all up the front of it. Plutonium on it, too. Amazing. That was normal operation in those days. We ran those facilities, and we ran them so well that by 1965, we had separated enough plutonium when it only existed in the parent uranium matrix to a half of a single weight percent, 0 0.005 weight fraction of plutonium maximum in that fuel. And we processed enough tons of uranium to recover enough plutonium by 1965 to meet the weapons needs of this country 10 times over for the foreseeable future. Now, we're talking about a massive amount of work. Hands-on, do it type thing. And there was a couple thousand of us, and we were just as happy as could be, just working like mad, making those plants run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in a community that ran on shift work, A, B, C, D shift. The whole community that way a wartime community, people dedicated to doing a job, and we were doing it, and we did it well. No pretense. Oh, yes, there were. Out in the reactor began to sneak in people who wanted a radiation monitor behind every reactor operator. 
Why? We know how to make these things run. When we got a metal fuel element stuck and it fell down on the trampoline back of the reactor, we'd go in with our feet and kick it off into the pool, smoking, burning. If you didn't have an instrument, you didn't know it was too hot, so you just went in and kicked it. Finally, along came a rule maker that says, thou shalt not do that. You'll get burned. Oh, I didn't get burned when I did it last week. But you exceeded the limit. Well, where did this limit come from? Turns out that in 1934, the International Commission on Radiation Protection fabricated a limit for x-rays. It was no longer permissible to be burned by them, erythema, reddening of the skin. You now had to keep a limit called two-tenths of an hour per day. How much is that? Well, you've got to have one of these Beckman instruments to read it, and you have to keep time of exposure. You know, there are four requirements on this thing the size of the source, the, therefore the strength of the source, the distance from the source, the time of exposure, and the intervening shielding to keep from getting burned. Oh, fine. We've been doing this thing for years now, and we've never been burned. Why have we got these rules? And they says, yours is not to ask questions. Yours is to do and die. Don't you ask questions. If you do, you might disappear. Those who broke the rules didn't appear the next day. Military rule? Oh, yes. Absolute. What was your appeal? And people you were working with one day, when they weren't there the next day, you didn't go inquire why. You were just grateful you still had your work to do and you kept right on doing it. Now this is in the United States of America. Well, in 1960, we found out that the uh, materials that we were working with, the thing that we called high-level waste, that if you waited three years, these million-gallon tanks that high-level waste went into boiled off 15,000 gallons of water a day. Fairly hot? Oh, yes. This material that if it ever broke a line would seal itself off in the ground within a foot, make its own glass. It wasn't going to go any place. We did that a time or two, accidentally, of course. And so we started packaging this cesium-137 in casts in railroad cars like that and shipping it to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they'd take it out and make it into a barium titanate and press it into a pellet. And those things were so hot that they actually glowed in the dark from the infrared heat. Now, thermal ionic conversions came along at this time. So you hooked these little heat sources up to thermionic converters, and you took electricity out this side. No moving parts. These things went into the SNAP program. And these uh, early SNAP power generators are what power the underwater transmitters for our nuclear navy. We've got a regular road map under the sea. All you've got to do is have an instrument that knows how to find it, and then you've got eyes on a submarine. You didn't know that, did you? The power from it came from this material that they now call waste. We processed that stuff and packaged it outside at Hanford. Well, we had rules that said 3R per year is your allowable exposure, that amount of gamma energy that will expose a film pack. But that was for the people that uh, didn't know. We weren't about to follow those rules. We just went ahead and did the job. They sent around an investigation slip that says your dosimeter was overexposed two weeks ago. What did you do? And they had a cute little form on it that says, accidentally exposed to light, and that was the one I always used to check. Because it's the same amount of light. You know, if you get gamma through the film pack, 
It's the same amount of light as you get when you click the lens on a camera. They wanted to limit us to that. And one day we looked up, and they had. They had limited us to that amount of exposure. Then the fun part of the game begins. You say, who limited us to that? Are they powerful? Yeah, they control the purse strings. They live by the golden rule. Them that's got the gold makes the rules. If you like your work, you keep the rules. If you don't keep the rules, you disappear. Sure enough, some of us disappeared. Some of my friends gone. Where'd they go? I don't know. Well, two years ago, I started traveling for American Opinion Speakers Bureau, and one of the documents that they had was Major Jordan's diary, a story of shipping the technology and the materiel that was developed at Hanford in 1944 directly to Russia on U.S. Air Force planes out through Great Falls, Montana, Fairbanks, Alaska, under the auspices of one Harry Hopkins, and with the at least tacit approval of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now what are you going to do? That thing that we had been doing and feeling so good about had been shared at no expense with Russia. You go back and you check the record and you find Russia did not develop their own nuclear atomic weapon until 1949 even when we supplied them the material and the knowledge. Four years after we touched them off at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We weren't happy with that. We were just happy doing our job. Well, in 1965, General Electric was ready to leave Hanford. I'd worked for General Electric for that 15 years. And they took me out to California San Jose, and we had in mind to design and build this nuclear fuel reprocessing plant at Morris, Illinois. They told me they were going to build it at San Luis Obispo. That's how they got me away from Hanford. But that was just to get me away from Hanford. I got to design the sampling analytical system for this plant. The sample cell was the hydraulic heart of this place. I got to dictate where they put the columns, how high the columns were in relation to my sample cell. One man standing in front of a lead glass window could sample any liquid stream in that whole plant. It took crews of men at Hanford to do the same thing. I wasn't happy with that, so I built an efficient system. I got to design that. I got to build it. Conceptual design, detailed design, build it, operationally test it. And in 1973, they says, forget it, friends. You don't get to run it. We had 170 tons, metric tons, of spent fuel stored in the basin. And the then president of the United States, do you remember who it was? Jerry Ford. Says, uh-uh, friends. No way. You don't get to run it. That's when I started to kick over the traces. Up to that point of time, I thoroughly enjoyed my work. I had no limitations, practical limitations. I had all the money to spend. I was in charge of the design effort. I built it the way that I wanted to because it was technically correct. All I had to do was check with engineers and make sure that it was right. And all of a sudden, I was told, you must reduce your limits of exposure by a factor of 10. I says, huh, I won't do it. First thing you know, you got the word that says, oh, yes, you will. And I says, no way. Well, that's when the rebel, Galen Windsor, started to show up. And when I found out that by management conference I couldn't get to these guys, I figured out another way. Now, in this pool is, in this plant is a beautiful pool. It's got uh, a place to store Spent fuel bundles till it won't stop. 660,000 gallons of water, demineralized, just as clear and pretty as it can be. 
heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit when the outside temperatures are a minus 20, wind chill factors down to a minus 60, and I found out that I could swim in that rascal. You turn off the lights at night and it had a light blue Kerenkov effect. And this kid from Nevada that never could pass up a warm swimming hole used to go swimming in that pool. There wasn't anybody that had the nerve to swim with me, but since I was manager of safety and analytical service of this plant, it was mine to use. Oh boy. I found out that I could do that. I showed some financial types one time that I could stir that pool with my bare hand and check out through the same radiation monitors they did without triggering it. GE didn't like it. I got a letter from him that says, thou shalt not tell financial types that you can swim in the pool, that you can stir it with your hand, because if they find that out, they will steal the inventory. They will know that the inventory can be stolen. Oh, is that an valuable inventory? The same material that's labeled high-level waste by our current government, our current Congress. Now, plutonium is an interesting chemical element. It is created in a nuclear reactor. The Manhattan Project built eight of these reactors at Hanford. The first one took 12 months from sagebrush to nuclear steam to build, and it had never been done in that size before. How could they do that? Why did they do it? To create this element called plutonium. Plutonium has been assessed as being the most hazardous material on Earth. Now, from the standpoint that you can make an atomic weapon out of it, yes, it is quite hazardous, because a piece of it that big, two and a half kilograms, that's only five pounds, is the force that delivered 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent over Nagasaki. Indeed, it is hazardous. The one over Hiroshima that had fully enriched U-235 in it was five times as big. So plutonium is more dangerous than U-235, is it not? By a factor of five. It takes five times as much U-235 as it does plutonium. Therefore, it is the most hazardous thing. Enter the great pretenders. They said that five grams of plutonium properly distributed over the face of the Earth would kill everybody on Earth. Now, if you can only get one 20 kiloton weapon to go on 2,500 grams, how's five grams going to kill everybody on Earth? Early on, I had a fear that said, if there is this much fissile material, that that can undergo a chain reaction, we called it in the beginning, then if you set a match to it, all the fissile material in the world is just going to keep right on going. Totally unfounded fear. It turns out that when you're in this business of recovering plutonium, like we recovered so much of it at Hanford, we found out that if you have it in a solution where it's less than 5% plutonium, it won't go critical any way that you kick it. And when you get it to 100% plutonium, you better be careful. Because if you put it in more than a 5-inch diameter cylinder, you're playing with fire. You can undergo what is known as an uncontrolled criticality, accidental criticality. The air turns blue. If the, pres if the cylinder is sealed, it will explode from steam pressure. And that steam pressure builds up in a millisecond, which is about that long. No, you don't horse with it. And then you find out that those eight-foot-thick shielding walls on those canyons were put there because they didn't know how much was a critical mass. They says, if we make a mistake, we don't want to die, so we will provide the shielding. 
And so this shielding thing started for no other reason than they didn't know what was a critical mass. Well, through the years, we got pretty good at telling what a critical mass was. And I have worked in a plant where I had half a critical mass in this hand, barehanded, dressed in street clothes, half in this hand, wearing a lab coat, and I'd put this half in a pocket on this side and this half in a pocket on this side and walk down the hall. If those two ever got together, there would be a blue flash. They never got together because I was in between them. And we do that every day. And each half had to meet definite dimension characteristics. And so we'd take them down and pass them one half at a time, and they'd measure it and say, yeah, that one will pass. And then we'd pass them the other half, and that one will pass too. But they were carefully put in separate bird cages so they couldn't get together accidentally. Well, those of us who worked with it enjoyed it. We knew what we were doing. We worked at it. When the President of the United States decided not to operate that fuel reprocessing plant, I started scrambling to find out what was going on. Many things had been done in the name of health and safety. Don't get burned. You've got to have safety record. You have to be safer than anybody else. We were already safer than anybody in the whole world. Well, you can't get afford to get burned with this. You've got to enforce the limits. You've got to keep it. And I says, hey, that's not what the ball game is at all. I'll bet you the ball game is something else. And in 1982, when the Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, a guy by the name of Mo Udall, I don't know whether you people in Arizona have ever heard of him or not, authored that bill. It's called the High Level Waste Disposal Act of 1982. The material he called waste is the reusable uranium fuel that I had been working on for 32 years. Needless to say, Mo Udall and I do not agree on whether that material is waste or not. The name of the game, then, is who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? The government says, bury it 3,000 feet deep in basalt, and we'll hold a contest among the states to see who gets to bury it. Oh, why do you want to bury it? Did you ask the owners? Who is the owner of the plutonium? May I submit that it's most likely the nuclear power ratepayer. He has paid for the mining, the fabrication of the parent uranium, power generation, and is being charged in advance for its burial. If you're paying for it, to whom does it belong? How much is it worth? In inflated dollars, a ton of reusable uranium fuel contains useful metal isotopes worth upwards of $10 million a ton. Mo Udall says it's high-level waste. The value of reusable uranium fuel scheduled for permanent disposal probably exceeds the national debt. Naturally occurring plutonium quantities, and you know plutonium does occur naturally, plutonium-244 is found at the residual activities of the several, eight at least, Oklo phenomenon reactors across the world. First one found at Gabon, Africa. Naturally occurring plutonium quantities have been enhanced by transmutation of uranium. That's the reason we built reactors in the first place. Our ability to detect and measure emissions from these elements is useful in inventory control. When fissile elements, fissile isotopes, 
are present at less than five weight percent plutonium-239 equivalent, and the heavy metal oxide matrix is stored dry in air, it has no critical mass. Remember we talked about shielding was because they didn't know what a critical mass was? If it is light water reactor fuel at less than 5% equivalent fissile content, you can handle it, you can do anything you want with it, you can stack it up, you can have a room full, you can have a handful. As long as you keep it dry, it will not sustain a chain reaction. What then is all this falderol about a little bit, five grams, will kill everybody in the world? Uh-uh. They don't know what they're talking about. And when they say that, they're thumbing their nose at measurement experts like Galen Windsor. I am insulted when they say those things and get away with it because it has no bearing on the truth. It cannot be mishandled. It will not expose any person to an unshielded nuclear reaction. In other words, no controls are necessary except to prevent the pilferage of the inventory. Have you got that one? Let it register. Do you need governmental rules and regulations and instructions? No way. Then why do we have all of those rules? Inventory control practices capitalized on the fear of undereducated masses who work in the industry. I didn't say anything about ordinary people now. I'm talking about the people who have worked in the industry and those who cast stones from without. The Ralph Nader's, the Jane Fonda's. Now, it doesn't take you much thinking to find out that maybe the industry is the source of the problem. The industry is the one that made up the committees, that made the rules, that the Congress enforced. You ever thought of it that way? The strangest kind of feather bedding that's ever been dreamed up, it makes the railroad engineers look like pikers. The only amounts of fissile process materials that are of health concern to the handlers are those that can accidentally cause an unshielded nuclear chain reaction, or that will cause erythema from the shortest wavelength, highest frequency, and therefore the most easily shielded ultraviolet light emissions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Big words. Let's see what they mean. The emissions from uranium, plutonium, cesium, all of those things are only important if you assemble an amount that if you get this amount and this amount together, it can go critical. You can get a blue flash and therefore get burned. And that's happened 34 times in the business, and eight men have died as a result of that. Accidental criticality. Documented in Los Alamos document 3611, if you want to check the source. Or if you've got enough of it together, that it's giving off ultraviolet light of this particular wavelength and frequency without any intervening shielding enough to burn you, sunburn you, erythema, reddening of the skin. If it's less than that, if the effect is less than that, then what is the problem? Excessive government regulation. That's what's the problem. Tritium. Heavy, heavy water. Deuterium is hydrogen-2. Tritium is hydrogen-3. 
if you let an inventory get away from you, what's going to happen to it out in the biosphere? Nothing other than it will become diluted and join the naturally occurring inventory of tritium because tritium is created in the upper atmosphere by sunlight. We have a natural inventory of tritium. Then the only thing that happens when you release tritium, which is the trigger mechanism for bombs, it's the source of the push that makes it go, is that you lost a valuable inventory. Then what of these people that are pretending that a little bit of tritium is going to do you in? It is not so. What are those two points? Only if it is an economically recoverable concentration or if it has a natural reconcentration mechanism. You know, there isn't any one of the radioisotopes out there that has a meaningful level of reconcentration in any of the species, not even the oysters in the bays in Maryland below Calvert Cliffs. Hmm. Why then are we still playing this game that any amount of this material is of hazard? Reusable uranium fuel, which has been isotopically enhanced in power-producing reactors, is a valuable national resource, not a high-level waste. The utility operators recognize the future worth of this commodity. Mo Udall, in that Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, imposed a tribute of a mill per kilowatt hour, a dollar per megawatt hour, on all electricity produced in a nuclear plant so that they can research and develop methods to throw it away. Why do the utilities willingly pay this amount? to the Secretary of Energy to limit their liability exposure. Who pays that amount anyway? The consumer of nuclear generated power. You have no choice and therefore I call it a tribute. At the same time they have provided their own storage basins at these reactors at ratepayers expense to retain ownership control of the plutonium resource. So you consumer, you ratepayer, you taxpayer are paying for the storage of this fuel and WNP2 at Hanford has storage that will take them through the turn of the century and yet every day they are paying a tribute to the Secretary of Energy with the concurrence of the United States Congress and signed by the President of the United States in 1982. 83. Who was that? Ronald Reagan. They have provided those storage basin at ratepayer expense to retain ownership control of the plutonium resource. I started playing a game one day, seven years ago. I says, okay, Portland General Electric, you've got the Trojan reactor, you've got a storage basin problem, I'm going to make you an offer. I made them an offer that says, I will take all of your spent fuel, FOB your basin, if you will give it to me. In other words, I will take it off your hands at no expense to you. I will ship it. I will store it. I will do everything that needs to be done to that fuel. And you know what they told me? Can I quote them? Go to hell, Galen Windsor. We value it more valuable than platinum or gold. We're going to play the plutonium futures ourselves. Now, where did I learn that the name of the game is who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? The first plutonium I saw was in a glass tube on the newsreel when I got back from the Pacific in 1946. And that that they had in a glass test tube, they said, was worth a half a million dollars. Certainly they had less than five grams of plutonium in that tube. That's pretty expensive stuff. 
And so for the show, they put a pot underneath it in case they dropped it. They said, we don't want to have to pick it up out of the rug. When we decided, when it was decided for us not to operate this plant, plutonium was guaranteed on buyback by the federal government at $43 a gram. That's quite a price drop, don't you think? When that price guarantee went away in October of 1971, the price of plutonium became $10 a gram. It steadily went down to where its present worth on the market is a minus $2 a gram per year. That's what it costs you to hold on to a plutonium inventory on a material that has been declared worthless by the utility owners and rubber stamped by the Congress of the United States, and they're spending billions of dollars digging hole in ordinary rock so that they can throw it away, dispose of it. Okay, what are you going to do with it? Reusable uranium fuel may be properly stored in air-cooled dry storage in a cost-effective manner. Newchem in Germany offers this immediate and long-term option as a necessary and safe step prior to reprocessing. They're doing it in Europe. At least four regionally located facilities are available in the United States where this concept can be used right now. Barnwell Nuclear Fuel Plant in South Carolina, Midwest Fuel Recovery Plant in Morris, Illinois, this one, Nuclear Fuel Services in upstate New York, and Redox Processing Plant at Hanford, Washington. These fully shielded, already radioactively contaminated storage areas have secure, limited access. All have been operated under processing conditions of 10 CFR 50 and the MFRP has a 10 CFR 70 storage license, the only licensed storage facility away from a reactor in the United States. It singly, all by itself, is capable of storing all of the reusable uranium fuel that needs to be moved away from power reactors for the remainder of this century. We had that storage designed in 1975 had the approval of the design. Why then are you spending money over here in New Mexico on the waste isolation project? Why are you spending money at Hanford at the basalt waste isolation project? Why are you spending money at Beatty, Nevada for storage when I can already store it in this building that's already built? I just named you three others that can do the job all by themselves too. And I know where there's 14 more buildings that can do it. What are we going to do? Redox and other excess facilities at Hanford are capable of dry storing all commercial RAF until plutonium recycle, at least through 5% enrichment, is reestablished. Or until the 22nd century, whichever comes first. RUF can be cost-effectively stored in existing facilities. Where does Mo Udall came off then, saying that you cannot use this plant for its intended purpose unless it is owned by the United States government? He has said that. The waste isolation projects are politically mandated wasting of national energy and construction resources. Plutonium proliferation by diversion of stored reusable uranium fuel is of minor importance compared to global availability of fully enriched uranium by laser isotopic separation. Let me explain that last thing that I said. Jimmy Carter said you can't ship plutonium to India, but in the same paragraph said you may ship them fully enriched uranium. Oh, Jimmy Carter. 
that peanut brain? What did he just say? He says that when the Israelis took out the reactor in Iraq, they had fully enriched uranium from France. And he says those rascals, those Iraqis, are going to take that fully enriched uranium, put it in that reactor, irradiate it to plutonium, and therefore have to recover the plutonium in a plant like this, and we stop them when the fully enriched uranium makes a better weapon than the plutonium in the first place. Now, when the President of the United States says things like that, and when the press gives it credibility, I get insulted. And right after I get insulted, I get angry. And I've been angry for quite a while now. And finally, one day, I said, my own personal security is not important. I think I'll go tell this tale. All I want is to tell my story. The commodity that I communicate is called truth. And so then I ask you a question, a very brief, pointed question. Who owns the plutonium, and how much is it worth? And then I'm going to attach on to that a question I want you to think about till we talk again. If you haven't been burned by this particular source of radiation, what is your problem? You obviously have one. Otherwise, you would join with me in telling the truth about this particular commodity. And so, yes, I'm recruiting helpers. What happened to the guys who taught me the business? Thousands of them. The hands-on business. Where are they? They're still there. Why don't they talk? Who are the they that say, this is the way the business is going to be run, whether it makes sense or not? 